This is London Real. I am Brian Rose. My guest today is Andreas Antonopoulos, the best-selling author, speaker, educator, and one of the world's foremost cryptocurrency and blockchain experts. You're the author of four books, including Mastering Bitcoin and the Internet of Money, and you travel the world advocating greater privacy and freedom in our financial lives. To date, mm -hmm. you've educated millions and are known for delivering stimulating talks that combine economics, psychology, technology, and game theory with current events, anecdotes, and history. Andreas, welcome back to London. Oh, thank you so much for having me back. It was so much fun the last two times we did it, and I'm, I'm glad we got an opportunity to do it again. Yeah, I'm so excited. It feels like you were here yesterday. I yeah. feel like I know you. And uh, I always tell people there's only one guest we have on to talk about crypto, blockchain, mm -hmm. and that's you, because oh, you are the you. guy that just, not only do you have an amazing history, you know so much about it, but you also, you kind of, you know, you separate yourself from the economics of that business. So mm -hmm. you are always this kind of, I don't know, true source of information. That's the way I look at you. Um, because, you. you know, you go out there really, I feel it's part of your mission just to spread information, right? Mm -hmm. Did I read that right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I like to think of myself as focused on education, but almost like the the Walmart greeter of open blockchains. So like the I'm the old guy who's standing inside the door, and you come in and you go, welcome folks, can I interest you in some barbecue equipment in aisle four this month? You know, it's like, uh, I, I'm, for many people, the first face they see, or the first video they watch when they get interested in crypto. And so now I've made it my mission to, to, to give people useful, neutral information that they can easily understand, and, and guide them on a safe road into this crazy space with all of the drama and madness that's going on around it. Yeah, and there is a lot of craziness. Mm -hmm. I may, I, and I might want to actually start with kind of my own history and education of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And then I, I really want to talk about what's going on with you. First of all, what's it like to be in London uh, compared to all the other places you travel? What's your relationship like with this city? Well, I lived here for 10 years. I'm half British. I went to school here um, and all of that. So. Um, London is exactly as I left it. Uh, I arrived yesterday. It's been raining continuously. It will rain continuously until the day I leave. <laughs> um, so it feels immediately familiar. Right. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I love London and, uh, and I come back often. And when I'm here and when I'm talking to people who are here, you'll probably notice my accent shifts and some more Britishisms start coming out of my mouth. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that London does to me. Yeah, it kind of pulls that out, right? Yeah. And otherwise, you literally are nonstop traveling the world. I mm -hmm. mean, we were talking earlier, and you were making a joke about Airbnb. I mean, you've basically been going from Airbnb to Airbnb for three and a half years, right? Yeah, so I quit, I quit having an apartment four years ago. And now I don't have a permanent base. Everything I own fits in two suitcases and a little shoulder bag and I travel with that continuously. That's all the belongings I have in the world. Um, 46 kilos, or for our American audience, 98 pounds of stuff. And there's this magical thing that happens when your stuff weighs less than you, and it takes a whole burden off, like just not having things. A very Zen way of life. Everything I need, I know exactly where it is, because I have to repack it after two weeks. And I just travel from place to place, which means half the flights, because I don't go back somewhere, right? And now I actually get to enjoy the places I visit, because most of the time, if I have a conference, I'll then stay for two weeks and, and get to see the city I'm in. Whereas before it was airport, airport, Marriott Hotel, conference, hotel, airport, home. And I'd never see a city. Hmm. I'd, I'd see it whisking by on the freeway. And why'd you choose to go nomadic? What was the final straw? The final straw was when I realized that I had been spending less than a month per year in my house uh, for more than a year. And in fact, I was in Rio de Janeiro. I was on Ipanema Beach. I was having a caperinha at 10 o'clock in the morning. And it was April. And Back home in the United States, the city where I was living at the time was under about a foot of snow and it was continuously snowing. And three weeks from that moment, I had another event in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And in between, I was flying home to do what? To pay bills, to 
restock the fridge, then have to empty the fridge, do laundry, unpack, repack, leave. And I'm like, why am I doing that? If instead I spent that week here, it's a shorter flight, I'm having a caperinha on the beach at 11 o'clock in the morning and it's not snowing, and I, it's actually cheaper for me to live here than it is to live back home. So I did it, and the cost of my life dropped quite substantially, in fact, because the United States is one of the most expensive places in the world to live. And it also allowed me to spend more time in the places where I think crypto is important, uh, specifically South America and Southeast Asia. Okay, good. And I want to talk about those locations and why mm. they're important for crypto. But I've, I've got a few guests, actually, that do what you do. I just had a, a yoga guy named Dylan Werner who does the same thing. A guy named Steve Maxwell. He just travels with that pack on his back, and mm -hmm. it's becoming more popular. It's becoming... Tim Sykes, as well, a trader. Just yeah, out. it's yeah. becoming tremendously popular, this whole digital nomad lifestyle. Um, but... I think it's important to remember that it also represents a unique and enormous privilege, and even a demonstration of privilege. First of all, I have a British and an American passport. That means I can go to 160 countries around the world for 90 days with no visas, no problems. Um, secondly, I can go to countries. Like, I've met a lot of people in my travels who I tell them, you know, have you ever visited the United States? And like, I've been trying for years, I can't get a visa. They won't let me in at all. Uh, successful people, people who have every reason to just visit as a tourist, can't get in. Um, same for Europe. And so that ability, it's not a matter of cost, but there is an enormous amount of privilege that comes with birthplace. Just yeah. a random fact of life that none of us have any control over. Right. Yeah, and that's going to be relevant because I want to talk about borders and money and mm -hmm. everything. So for anybody watching now, we're going to get down into it and talk about, you know, the rise in Bitcoin over a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, the blockchains, implications, and then what what is suitable for blockchain technology and what is not. You did a great speech recently where you said, <laughs> throw out a word and throw blockchain at the end of it. And does mm -hmm. this make sense? And mm -hmm. you said healthcare, asparagus, all this other stuff. So <laughs> I want to talk about that, why and why this conversation is important. Your last conversation with us, the privacy of your money and your transactions is something we really talked about, and it's something yeah. so serious that I don't think people really think about. You yeah. know, people always are, are clamoring about the privacy on their devices and the privacy of their social media platforms, and yet they don't even think twice that all of their banking and transactional information is known by a company that we don't really think much about. And that information is probably more crucial in understanding what you're all about than all the posts on Facebook. So yeah. I'd love to talk about that as well. Yeah. Um, I was just having a bit of a memory lane going back through our episodes and my own experience with Bitcoin. I'm gonna give you my quick background and then maybe you can give us maybe your quick background and then mm -hmm. some of the big things that you're seeing that, that we need to talk about with crypto. Sure. So for me, the first episode I had on crypto was back in May 2013. And I had, of all people, Max Kaiser from Russia Today on the show mm -hmm. who had been talking about Bitcoin for a long time and I didn't know who else to talk about. Um, I did, couldn't find you at the time. And so Kaiser came over and started talking about Bitcoin. I had actually played around with some Bitcoin about a year earlier wow. um, and might have used some Bitcoin. I may or may not have used some to buy something on the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. um, and at one point I had an episode about psychedelics and that kind of thing. And it was later- Asthma inhalers is a very important product they had on the Silk Road. Oh, really? Okay. So are you sure it wasn't an asthma inhaler? An asthma inhaler. Because they're very expensive, especially in countries where they don't have good health care. Okay, interesting. No, I think it was dimethyltryptamine <laughs> that I later smoked on an episode uh, in, all, in, all, in all candor. But at the time, that was the early, road, the early days of the Silk Road. It was actually quite a user-friendly place with great reviews, and then it all went wrong, and mm -hmm. Dread Pirate Roberts and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I had Thanksgiving at my house in 2013 and Max Kaiser was there and one of my old banking buddies was there, a trader from Goldman, and they actually transacted uh, a one a Bitcoin for $1,000 at my Thanksgiving table. Wow. And I think that was one of the mini pops. I think it came down from there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, look, I just started talking to you about it. A lot of people started having conversations to understand what crypto was. And then the next day to point, and I'll tell you this, this is fascinating, was at a Christmas party at my company almost a year and a half ago where I was talking to the team and I realized that half of my, of my team was invested in crypto. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is crazy mm -hmm. because it became a speculative instrument all of a sudden and it was this kind of a boom. And I was just like, wow, this is weird um, because no one else here was buying stocks and yet they were in 
current crypto. Yeah. Um, so anyways, that, and then we saw some ICOs and then the price came down. And so that's kind of been my weird little ride of, of personal experience with crypto yeah. and talking to you, which is fascinating. Yeah. Um, so uh, first of all, what do you think of some of those data points as far as what I remember of crypto? Because I mean, I'm surprised at how early you picked up on it. And I think it takes quite an open mind to, to pick up on this technology, especially when it was much less well known. Today, it's a household name. You know, you see it on TV all the time. Um, but there was a time when nobody was talking about this other than geeks. And it wasn't v much before when you got involved. Right. Um, so, and, and if you in fact got involved in the middle of 2012, that's the same time I uh, found out about it and started getting involved. Okay, and you'd re you read the white paper on it and were yes. just fascinated by the elegance mm -hmm. of the technology, right? That's correct, yeah. It just blew my mind. And the price of Bitcoin then was roughly? Two dollars. Two dollars. Yeah. Okay. And so I got interested and I started playing with the technology and reading about it and looking at the code and trying to understand it and finding that I couldn't understand it and that made me even more intrigued. And yeah, I mean, that's that story that that path is one that a lot of people have. Um, first of all, there's an element of skepticism at first, which is absolutely healthy, and, and there should be, right, in all of these things. In fact, if anything, there's not enough healthy skepticism in this industry. Um, and then people start doing their own research, trying to make a list of reasons why this isn't a good idea. I, in fact, I had someone who started writing a book um, they were telling me they started writing a book about why Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. And they started doing the research for that book and then abandoned it three quarters in because they disproved all of their points. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> they couldn't, um, they kept finding evidence that all of the things they thought were actually misunderstandings and turns out it wasn't. And then they got really into it. Mm. Pretty much everybody who gets involved in this technology starts with a very skeptical perspective. And then perhaps ignores it the first once, twice, three times they hear about it, and then eventually dips a toe, gets completely fascinated by it, and then dives right in. And I meet people who are on the other end of that journey, and like, I quit my job. I was working for a bank. I was working for you know a corporation. I was I had a secure job with a pension and. I quit it all, I work for a startup, or I'm self-employed, or I'm doing consulting, or something like that. So not just dive into the technology, but change the trajectory of a career. Starting a computer science degree for someone who was never into programming, and they want to learn how to code because of their fascination with cryptocurrency. It changes people's lives. Yeah, absolutely. Is it, is it a cult, cultish? Like people get into it and they want to dedicate their life to it. I mean, There's you said you that. didn't sleep for, you know, and eat for days when yes. you first read about it, right? But, but I have that response to technology. It's, it wasn't this specific technology. I had that response previously to other technologies that fascinate them, like the early internet, the first web browser, uh, the first open source operating system, my first computer when I was 10, that happened to me. Um, there are many reasons why people may get obsessed, right? Some people are driven by technology, they get obsessed by that. Some people are obsessed by some of the uh, political and ideological implications of breaking down borders and connecting the world and freeing people from control of governments and corporations of privacy. Some are excited by the investment, speculation, and the possibility of getting rich, right? Which is a terrible idea. Um, but that attracts a lot of people, right? So I would say the majority of people, the first time they get involved in crypto, it's probably because they heard that it's uh, some kind of investment opportunity. Someone tried to sell it to them in some unscrupulous way, or they got pulled into a Ponzi scheme, or one of the other... Uh, cryptocurrencies that are more or less pump and dump scams. And then they discover that's a pump and dump scam and they're like, find others that are not, right? Um, no matter what the motivations. I think in the end, the people who stay after the price does one of those, um, find another reason to be interested. So they might come in because of speculation and mania and then the ones who were only motivated by that, they leave. And the ones who stick around a year into the crash 
have found other motivations. They like the community, they understand the technology a bit better, they're driven by the, the political implications. And I tried to cultivate the understanding of the technology. So like, okay, welcome. You came because you want to get rich. That's okay. You're all welcome. Now let me tell you about why you should stay because of the technology, even after the price crashes. How do you feel when it's the big speculation moment? Because like Bitcoin is almost like, uh, not your baby, but it's something that you've had a relationship for a long time. And then yeah. in 2017, we saw that it was just this massive speculative play. People are jumping in and all that stuff. How did, does that bother you when people are coming in for that reason? Or how do you feel emotionally when you see people make a lot of money, lose a lot of money? You got these people in Puerto Rico that went down and like took over San Juan and started throwing money around and the ICO billionaires. And like, what do you see? How do you feel when you see that stuff? And what do you see? I mean, it, it, it bothers me to a certain extent. Um, first of all, 2017 was the seventh or eighth bubble. And it wasn't even the largest one because you know when you look at these assets or currencies, you gotta think of percentages, right? right? So when something goes from a dollar to $30, it doesn't feel like a huge rise, but it's actually a 3000% rise, which is bigger, which it did in 2012. Right. which was a bigger rise than the recent one. It's just the numbers are bigger now. Right. But as a percentage, actually, the spreads have been getting smaller. And every time this happens, it attracts the wrong crowd. It attracts um, scammers, opportunists, uh, pump and dumpers, pyramid schemers. And the ICO market enabled a lot of those people to make their own coin. One of the things that people don't realize the, the reason this all happened in the ICO market is because um, a new um, blockchain, a new open public blockchain called Ethereum made it so that you could build a scalable, secure, transferable, censorship resistant, open borderless blockchain on top uh, by writing 20 lines of code. Okay. So the Ethereum allowed other people to piggyback on that framework yes. to launch their ICOs. It's a, it's a programmable blockchain. So what do people use a programmable blockchain to do? I have many ideas, all of which are interesting and fascinating projects, mostly around censorship and privacy. But that's not what people chose to do. They chose to build these platforms to do massive pump and dumps and to launch all of these startups which is interesting in the long run, because if you can fund uh, startups with an international pool of investors and actually bring startup-like investors to people around the world who don't have access to those investments, that can change the investment field. Right. But that's not what happened. 99% you... of them were just outright scams. Right, and maybe we should do some backup and do a few definitions for people that aren't completely mm -hmm. up the curb. So the original cryptocurrency was really Bitcoin. Yes. It's been around since 2010? 2009. Nine, January okay. 3rd, 2009 was the launch. And it was pretty much the only crypto that you would have been trading up until 2014 or 15, really? No, uh, there were... Well, there was a few others, right? The, the, and the altcoins started, as they're called altcoins or alternative coins, started in 2011, I believe, was the first one. Okay. And they were mostly um, kind of clones of Bitcoin. Then by 2014, we had another round of altcoin growth, and then Ethereum was launched. And Ethereum made it simple to like put building blocks together programmatically and build all kinds of different features, including uh, ICOs, which stands for Initial Coin Offering. Um, and these are essentially crowdfunding schemes, just like an IPO is initial public offering of a stock. And all of these companies that had various ideas um, wrote a white paper, built a platform to do crowdfunding, and then publicly launched their offering. These are were obviously unlicensed security offer, securities yeah. offerings, many from different places in the world where they couldn't be prosecuted or no one even picked up on that for a while. Yeah, and that's the thing, people see IPO and ICO and an IPO usually is something that's been kind of vetted by an exchange, the SEC in America and- You have to go through certain facts. Right quite a bit, and then you can in, in, in invest in something that's going public that might have a lot of growth opportunity, like we saw yeah. Uber do recently. Now an ICO, it's a similar 
thought of raising money for a venture. From investors. Except yeah. this one has a blockchain and it immediately has some international liquidity, doesn't yes. rely on an exchange, but. And it's tradable everywhere. Everywhere, but there's no regulation involved or very little. Yeah, and it's, it's important to realize that regulation isn't what keeps investors protected, not really. In fact, in many ways, what regulation has done is it, uh, it allows investors to outsource the vetting and research they should be doing, right? Um, and it creates a bottleneck, so very few companies can actually do this kind of crowdfunding, which leaves a massive gap in the market where many, many great startups never get to that stage because right. they don't have a way to get funding. And then at the same time, many, many giant scams and pyramid schemes are listed on the stock markets after being carefully vetted by regulators. And if I name any of them while I'm in London, I'm opening myself to a whole bunch of lawsuits. But uh, we all know them, right? Various uh, companies that do uh, what they call multi-level marketing, right? That are straight up pyramid schemes, but right. they're listed on the stock exchange. And, um, and of course, many funds that have had massive problems and have been Ponzi schemes, they go straight through the regulators. Uh, in fact, Bernie Madoff was the head of the regulatory agency, uh, which tells you a lot. We need to think differently about what protects investors. What really protects investors is education. And one of the ways investors get educated is by getting burned a bit, losing a bit of money in poorly thought and risky investments, and then having to learn the hard way and try again and again until they develop a better skepticism and better analytical skills. You can't outsource that to someone else because if you go looking for information on whether something is reliable and real or not, the people who know how to use social media and use marketing and write fancy white papers are, are the scammers. They're gonna get your eyeballs first. And this is what happened with ICOs. So it's not inherent in the ICO thing itself that they're scams, not at all. In fact, my prediction has been that in the long run, if we look at this from the perspective of a decade or two, um, the opportunity to take startups and give them to international investors and bring investors from all around the world to invest in startups, cut out the middleman, accelerate the possibilities, will force education of investors all around the world so that the investors who are less sophisticated become as sophisticated as you see in Western developed economies. Until then, the scammers will exist. Right, and a large percentage of the ICOs end up being scams? N more than 99% of them. Wow, yes. okay. And, and, and some of them are being prosecuted um, slowly, but, uh, but this is a game that the regulators are losing because they're operating on a completely different time scale. Uh, so, you know, it takes them three years to build up an investigation and these things were launching, you know, 10 a day during the peak um, and many of them from jurisdictions all over the world. So, you know, there is no universal jurisdiction for these things and nor should they be. Right. Which means also very hard to regulate things in Puerto Rico and Malta. Impossible. And, impossible, right. Okay. Impossible. And, and how did you feel in 2017 when Bitcoin's going up to, what was its high? $30,000? 20 something. Okay. And Ethereum's up and all these ICOs are happening. I'm sure everyone's asking you what you think. What, what, what do you Everybody who I hadn't seen since high school was connecting with me and saying, hey, you seem to know about this stuff. Is this a good time to buy? I was like, absolutely not. Do not get in. This is, first of all, this is not a good time to buy. This is a good time to read. Go read something, learn something. And until you feel comfortable to answer that question by yourself, you shouldn't be involved in this. And when you see something going like this, guess what comes on the other side of that? If you see an investment curve like this, it's very quickly followed by an investment curve like this. N nothing goes exponential without going down. Right. And Bitcoin's done this eight times already. It's a common pattern, we've seen it. That's how it grows, and the reason it grows like that is because there isn't much in terms of short pressure to hold it down, so people to speculate on it dropping to keep a lid on the, on the pressure, and there's a limited supply. And all of the cryptos behave more or less in accordance with what Bitcoin's doing. So if you've got something that has limited supply and you suddenly have a speculative mania that blows up, 
it's going to go like this, which only further fuels the mania, uh, until it reaches a point where there simply isn't anybody else who feels just as enthusiastic, and it pauses for a second, and the moment it pauses for a second, the panic just drives it down. This is what happens, and I'm not interested in that part of it. Right. That actually goes against the message of, look, Absolutely. this is an amazing tool. Yeah. I mean, if the speculators, well, I mean, look, if they weren't in it, which I know you can't say speculators stay out and real investors stay in, but if, for example, the price had stability for a long period of time, people could see that this technology is going to be helpful for transactions and privacy and borderless, right? There, there's no difference between speculators and investors, right? All investors are speculators. Um, they're just speculating with a different risk profile, and some of them with very little research and information. And the reason this is bad is because a lot of good, innocent, slightly naive people lost a lot of money. Some people had their lives destroyed by this. And that then, you know, apart from the morality of that in the first place and the impact that has on people's lives, it changes the community. It, it causes damage to the community. So you have a lot of fractioning within the community. You have a lot of drama that comes up. When there's money on the table, people's personalities change. Right. Like people get tempted, they start taking shortcuts, their ethics get compromised, power corrupts, money corrupts. And it was one of those cases where suddenly every conversation I was having had absolutely no depth. It had no substance. It was all about how do I get to the money as quickly as possible. Right, or how much money I just made, or Bitcoin's right. going here. So everything just became... Well, I was being asked to become an ICO advisor. I can't imagine... 10 times a day. Yeah, I can't imagine the, the money that's, that's been thrown at you for that kind of stuff. Uh, I can tell you the price, it was, we, pu we published some of the letters, many of the people in the space who were being asked, they were offering a quarter of a million dollars for a single social media post, and to, to put my name on their website. Does that, um, does that test your commitment to your values and ethics or not even for a second? It tests my stomach and whether I can keep my lunch down. I mean, it was disgusting. I, I put up a page on my, on my site where it said promote, ad advertise or advise for your ICO, which was just a long page of why I won't do it. And I put it on my contact page because people kept sending me contacts through whatever form they could find. So I put a form up there that just went straight into the trash. Um, <laughs> and it made the, you disgusted. Absolutely. Because someone is ruining something you think is beautiful. If, and damaging people's lives and behaving in unethical ways. And, uh, and also they're asking me to compromise my values. I don't do endorsements. I don't do products. I'm, I don't talk about products. I don't talk about projects. I don't talk about people. I talk about technology. I'm not interested in the price, and I, I've never done that. So when all of these people were asking me to be their advisor, I was like, look at my work. I've consistently declined to do that. I'm not going to start doing it now. Certainly right. not. And you've never been tempted to be the CEO of some company or to be advisor to this? or I mean, I am the CEO of a company. Sure. I'm the CEO of uh, actually several companies. I'm the CEO of um, an education company. Uh, an events company, a publishing company that's now published six different books, uh, both my own and others, and, um, and a consulting company where I do advisory work. So this is one of the things. I actually do advise companies. The first rule of my advisory contract is you can never mention my name to anyone and I will never mention your name. That's it. That's the first rule. So a lot of companies that came to me, they said, we want you to be an advisor. I'm like, okay, well, the first rule is you can never mention my name to anyone and where'd you go? <laughs> <laughs> it was a very easy way to clear out all of the, the bullshit. They because they wanted an endorsement at the end That's of the what day. they wanted. They right. wanted my marketing. And as soon as I took that off the table, they weren't interested in my advice. I actually do have a couple of companies that I work with and they're interested in serious strategic advice and asking my opinion and helping them understand the market, which I understand quite well. Um, and it's not a big business for me. I don't have much time. I don't charge ridiculous rates. 
Um, it's about me having an opportunity to be involved in, in some of the development stuff, which I really enjoy doing and, and helping companies build better products or understand the market better. Um, and I don't take clients and I don't, uh, I don't say yes easily to that kind of thing. Uh, the whole point of that is just to keep me in touch with some of what's happening around the world. Okay, so crypto's going up in 2017. Yeah. It's obvious to you that it's gonna come back down, but people at the same time are saying, look at the market cap of gold, mm -hmm. look at the market cap of fiat currencies, mm -hmm. of all this, and now if crypto is gonna be here to stay, and we believe it is because of the technology, right. that justifies a 100x price, a 1,000x price of Bitcoin. Even if it does, that's not gonna happen in a month. Even if it does, at that point, that curve has so outpaced the deployment of infrastructure we need, the development of scaling technology, the user interfaces that we need to onboard new people, the education that those people need in order to not lose the crypto that they just got involved in. Right. We, there's a pace that's gated by the development of the technology and it happens in cycles. So there's some infrastructure in place which supports a certain scale of applications and a certain set of capabilities within those applications. And then those applications get designed and produced with hopefully good user experience and user interfaces so that people can use them securely and easily. And that allows a certain number of people to get involved who previously, it was too difficult, there wasn't enough right. infrastructure, whatever. But that gets built in the booms. That's the funny thing about it. It doesn't get built in the booms. It gets built in the winter. So it's getting built during the winter time. Okay. In the booms, no one has time to build anything because you're getting completely overwhelmed by all of this noise. But the exchanges are getting involved and the brokers are getting the involved. The money is and coming Coinbase in. was building yes. up infrastructure and... Coinbase was struggling to keep up. All okay. of the exchanges were struggling to keep up. At some point they were, they were signing up 100,000 clients a week um, during uh, probably the first or second week of December, which was the peak of the craziness. Right. And you can't do anything. You can't think strategically. So we have limits to what can be achieved in any technology. Once you have new applications and new people come in and you get a bit more investment, that creates a need for more infrastructure to support the new people who have come in, to grow the scale. So we build more infrastructure. As soon as we do that, that creates the possibility of new applications at new scales. So those get built, which then creates the, an opening for new users who previously found it too difficult to enter, and the cycle keeps repeating. And at that rate, even technologies that are growing at an exponential rate, um, or at least a super linear rate, 10% um, compounded year on year, 20% compounded year on year, like the internet, right? Right. Um, that's still a crazy fast rate. And there will be corrections. Mm -hmm. But it's not, 6,000% in two months, right? That, at that point, you've so outpaced the ability of the technology to even absorb that many people that you know what's coming next. Right. At least I did. And yet, like any boom and bust cycle in humanity, and you go from the tulips to dot-coms to anything, when we're in the middle of it as humans. Nobody we, wants to hear the, the, we, the opinion. We don't know anymore. Fact, the illusion becomes the reality and we want to buy it. And the emotion takes over and it's fear and greed and... I was being invited to uh, media interviews nonstop. And one of the things they asked me to do is go on and debate whether crypto is in a bubble. And so the interviewers or the journalists would, would, would stick a microphone in my face and go, do you think crypto is in a bubble? And you know, they were hoping I'd say no. And I was like, yeah, of course it's in a bubble. And they deflated me, they were like, oh, come on, where am I gonna go with that answer? <laughs> like, <laughs> I was hoping to go to the other guest who was gonna call you an idiot for saying it's not, right? But they just deflated my balloon. <laughs> or, um, and so of course it's in a bubble. It's a very obvious and very extreme version of a bubble, but keep in mind, so is real estate, automobiles, student loans, healthcare, education, the stock market, the bond market, the asset market, the commodity market. And in fact, all of those are quietly in some of the worst bubbles we've ever seen, driven by $21 trillion of debt in the US and massive stimulus spending by all of the central banks. And nobody's calling them a bubble. And if they burst, we're gonna have a much bigger problem on our hands, right? If crypto bursts, yeah, people are gonna get hurt, but it's a fairly 
limited number of people on a fairly limited capital basis who, who the, the craziest of them invested big parts of their net worth, but most people didn't. But when the real estate market or the jobs market or corporate bonds crash or currencies crash, it takes entire countries, it, it wipes out the middle class, it causes long-term generational destruction. None of the journalists want to talk about that. <laughs> right. When I steer the conversation in that direction, I'm like, yeah, guess what else is in the bubble? The S&P 500, like, uh, uh. <laughs> Right, don't want to talk about that. Yeah. And then, of course, the crypto people didn't want me to talk about that. So I, I go out and I do an interview, and I, uh, I remember it was a, a podcast, a popular podcast, and they asked me, is crypto in a bubble? I said, absolutely, it's in a bubble. Of course it is. In fact, I expect we're not going to go much further, and I'm really worried about the pace of this. It's going to cause some damage. The very next week, they did a, another podcast in another place talking about this interview, and the, the screenshot, the thumbnail, was me in a Darth Vader mask, and the title of the thing was, Has Andreas Gone Over to the Dark Side? Because I said the B word, I said bubble. And I was like, how could you say it's in a bubble? This is... Because you're such an advocate of the currency, they didn't, they didn't yes. expect you to say I, that. I betrayed <laughs> the doctrine by saying it's in a bubble. Yeah, it was a bubble, and it was ridiculous. And, and as soon as it finished, um, I was very saddened by the fact that I knew a lot of people had been hurt, but I was like, okay, now we can get back to work. Now we can start building. And, and I that's... actually started writing my fourth book. Okay. Um, just about a week after the bubble burst. Okay, and so we've been in that winter now for what, a year and a half? And what is that? What actually, is... we've, we popped out of the winter about a month ago. Okay. Cause but, it's... At least of the deep freeze. All right, and Bitcoin started going up so it went from from about twenty thousand down to I think the lowest was about thirty one hundred U.S. dollars, and then it over the last month and a half it went back up past nine, and then in the last couple of weeks retrenched a bit, uh, and is now at about seven thousand nine hundred. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you know, and these cycles keep repeating. A lot of people forgot about it. And then the funny thing is that one of the things that gives us strength is people hear that this bubble thing has happened and they're like, okay, so it's dead. You see, the, the quintessential thing about bubbles that are not based on any fundamentals, like tulip bubbles, is they burst once. That's it. They never reinflate again. Cyclical growth bubbles, which are in things that actually do have foundation, like real estate going, or in a, a whole economy, you know, growing fast and then going through this kind of cycle, or crypto, which actually some of it does have fundamentals behind it, reinflates again. So now we had another big run up. I mean, it doubled in price in a month and a half, which is again too fast. Right but now it's in play again, and we're gonna to start to potentially see oh, similar hope, behaviors. I hope not. I hope, but I hope people learned. But if you look at the price action over the last eight, 10 years, it's coming again soon in the next 12 to 24 months. There'll yes. be another breakthrough, and guess what? It'll probably go over the previous price. <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe not. I mean, okay. it might keep going down again, and we may end up back in the, in the, in the negative territory. I, don't, don't know, don't right. care. Don't care. What I do care about is that over the past two years, what has happened is a lot of the money that flowed in obviously turned into investments. A lot of people got jobs and got hired, and some of them were developers, and um, big exchanges and wallets and things like that. They were able to use some of the appreciation in price for their holdings to invest in infrastructure, to build better operation center, to hire more customer service people so that they could better withstand the next cycle. And out of that comes better software and more development. So developers have been hard at work. They really never stopped. Um, the community's grown. And once again, you get to see who's really in it for the technology and who isn't. The ones who weren't, bye-bye, see you later. And, you know, we're, we're hard building and you know, I've been building an education machine, effectively, to be able to scale what I do uh, and get it to more people. 
Okay, well good, I wanna talk about what you think are the five pillars of open blockchains, because I think the way you describe it is really important. Mm -hmm. um, I was just having flashbacks. I was in the dot-com boom, so I moved to New York City from London in around May, July, no, think about July 99. And I was the CFO of a dot-com startup, mm -hmm. had about $20 million raised. We were selling luxury goods on the web. Well, we had no idea what we were doing. Um, and I remember going out with all my buddies in New York City and just giving them the whole dot-com, this is the future, Columbus mm -hmm. in the new world, what was yes. his ROI, and wrote it all up. And I remember in like 2003, there was some company called Google. And I just remember thinking, nobody wants to even hear the word technology because yes. it was just played out, disgusting. I don't even want to hear it because I want to yes. move on to something else. Yes. And that's why I ignored something like Google because I was like, right. no one cares, no one wants to know. When in fact, Google was obviously great technology and really useful stuff and it became another great company. And what people forget was Google wasn't the first search engine. It was the 21st search engine. And in order for it to succeed, 20 other companies, big, well-capitalized, well-researched companies failed. Um, and that happens in any technology. Yeah, railroads in America, well, it was a lot right. of the same thing. A lot of these massive companies build up, competed with each other, and then bankruptcy, bankruptcy, consolidation. But a that's, a, that that's an actually a normal and even healthy way for capitalism to work. Agreed. You break it if you try to bail out the companies during their bankruptcies, um, because then companies that shouldn't survive, survive. And that's a disadvantage to the ones that are actually healthy, because they don't get to pick up on the market the employees, the capital goods, the infrastructure that gets liquidated in bankruptcy and put it to better use because they've been doing better business. And one of the advantages of this kind of washout cycle is that it takes out all of the pretenders and all of the badly um, chosen ideas and all of the bad execution and, of course, the scams. To continue watching the rest of the episode for free, visit our website, londonreal.tv, or click the link in the description below.